So now we have another exciting day. So I'm thrilled to introduce our first speaker this morning. Um, I know some of you have heard from Dr. Lamont Black, and he is phenomenal. He is um, really great at explaining some very complicated and technical things to audiences. Um, he's a finance professor at DePaul University in Chicago, and he is a recognized expert on emerging technologies like cryptocurrency, blockchain, the metaverse, and artificial intelligence. So we're incredibly fortunate to have him here today. So I'd please join me in welcoming to the stage, Lamont Black. <laughs> All right, rock it. Yes. Yeah, let's do this. Thank you, Patty. Thank you to the Michigan Credit Union League. I'm Lamont Black. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning. All right, so we're gonna jump in and talk about our digital future. What is the future? This is a question that I like to ask, I like to pose to credit unions to help you think about where your industry is headed, where you can start to adapt, innovate to remain relevant, for your members. So I think all of us are aware, things are changing, the world is changing around us. With technology, much of that change is accelerating. So before we jump into this topic, let me just say a little bit more about myself. Thank you, Patty, for the introduction. Uh, with an audience like this, I love to connect. I'm starting a newsletter about these types of topics. If you wanna connect, you can do so through that QR code, just pull out your phone. Um, I'm in Chicago. So I'm not far from here. My wife and I, we've got three kids. We love to come to Michigan. We do a lot of camping in the Michigan State Parks. Uh, so we're very much part of the Midwest and the Great Lakes region. Uh, this last year, I joined Filene Research Institute, which many of you know is a think tank for the credit union industry. I'm now a fellow leading this thing called the Credit Union of the Future. So doing research, trying to help you understand where things are headed, putting out webinars, white papers, and other types of content. Uh, fun fact, I am now in a crypto documentary that you can stream on Amazon Prime or Apple TV. It's called The Highest of Stakes. So some of you have seen my crypto presentations. You're not gonna get that today, sadly. Uh, but if you're into crypto, I would encourage you to check that out. It's a really, it's a, a fun and wild ride. And then lastly, Wide Open Ventures. This is a company I've started just to go beyond education, helping credit unions think about how to apply this, having conversations about how to implement this in some of your own institutions. Uh, earlier this week, I was with Honor Credit Union in Southwest Michigan. Let's hear it for Honor Credit Union. So, um, this is what I enjoy doing, and I'm so thankful that I've connected with Patty and Janet and the, the credit union movement. I've been doing this for over the last two years. And so what I wanna do with you this morning is, first of all, lay out a little bit of the landscape. You know, things, as I said, are changing very quickly, and those, there's a lot of different frontiers that you have to be paying attention to. I'm just gonna to touch on those briefly. Then I'm gonna give you a quick sneak peek into a project I'm working on through the Filene Lab called Blockchain for Lending or Tokenizing Loans. So if you've seen me speak over the last two years, you've probably heard me try to explain blockchain. How many people now understand blockchain? Okay, we're working on it, we're working on it. Um, but I've got a breakout this afternoon at 1.45 and uh, I'm gonna demonstrate a very unique and specific proof of concept that we have built and I'll give you a quick sneak peek of that during this session. The heart of this session is going to be on artificial intelligence and how do you adopt that as a credit union. I believe this is really the topic for 2024 if we're gonna talk about emerging technology. And so I'm gonna focus on that and I'm gonna give you a bit of a template that I've designed to try and help you understand how you could move forward. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about creative collaboration, which is really a unique benefit of being part of the credit union movement because it is so collaborative, but I'm gonna really push that a little bit further to be thinking about how do we collaborate on these types of issues. I had the, the privilege of spending some time this morning with the YP group. Let's hear the YP group, you in the room? Yes, yes. 
I turned 50 in August, and so I was telling them, sadly, I used to be one of the YPers. I think maybe not anymore. <laughs> yes. But no offense, I look around the room and I think, hey, I'm not doing so bad, you know, like. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I got a few years left in me. All right, so let's jump in. Let's talk about the landscape. So I'm sure whether you're a board member or you're on an executive team or whether you're kind of helping lead somehow in your credit union, you're aware that there are a lot of emerging trends in the financial services sector. And let me just give you a phrase we've started using at Filene. Mark Meyer is a big fan of this. Everything, everywhere, all at once. It's just a, a, way, a phrase to capture how much things are changing, but also how your member expectations are changing. If you think about the traditional credit union model of the past, it was very branch-based, it was very face-to-face -face conversation based. And I am not anti-branches, I am not anti-face-to-face, -face, but things are quickly moving in a new and different direction, and a lot of that is to digital platforms that no longer rely on those delivery methods. So if you think about a list like this, instant payments, digital wallets, open banking, embedded finance, omni-channel, artificial intelligence, decentralized platforms. Now I could spend this entire session trying to break down each one of these, and you'll notice if you look at the agenda, there's a number of these on different parts of the agenda later today, including open banking. These are things that could radically change the way you do business. Think about the smartphone. When that was introduced in 2007, you might have thought of it as like cute or interesting. It was a way to make a phone call. It was an app store. But suddenly a new technology radically changes the way your members interact with your organization. That was 15 years ago. This is not the be all end all of technology. This is continuing to evolve and each of these trends is going to be showing up and knocking on your door and you have to be asking yourself, how are we preparing ourselves? I'm not saying you have to jump into the deep end, but you at least have to be dipping your toes in the water. You have to be raising your head and looking to the horizon. That's a big part of what I try and do with credit unions is just don't get so focused on the day-to-day -day operations, trying to manage interest rate risks, trying to do asset liability management. No offense, Charlie McQueen. <laughs> These are important things to do to make sure your bank survives and thrives in this year and the year ahead. But if you start, don't start paying attention to these things and educating yourself five to 10 years from now, what is your role in the market? I had the, the privilege of uh, spending three months in Bend, Oregon during COVID. Anybody know what Bend, Oregon is famous for? The last Blockbuster. <laughs> blockbuster owned the video rental market. Netflix took that away. Within a few years, Blockbuster no longer existed. You don't want to be the Blockbuster of the future with these emerging trends. I know that a lot of this is scary. So when I spend time with boards talking about emerging technology, a lot of the conversations that come up are around cyber threats, identity fraud, think about AI and deep fakes. We had a conversation last night about that. It just starts to feel impersonal. If you've been in the credit union movement and you're in like 60s or 70s, it can just start to feel like, gosh, are we just, are we losing our touch with real people? And it's just this fear of disruption. But what I want to encourage you to think about is if you lean into this, what appears like fear or risk could actually be opportunity. Think about this other list on the right side, thinking about many of these technologies can improve your cybersecurity. Many of them can improve identity verification. AI is going to be an arms race 
If you apply it appropriately, you can stay ahead of the bad guys. What might feel impersonal is moving towards personalization. For credit unions, personalization, for many of you, is sitting down with a member and having a conversation. But in the world of the future, for millennials, for Gen Z, personalization is how much do I feel like you understand me when I'm using your app. My wife is just a little bit younger than me. She does everything through her phone. And I don't mean phone calls. She's just constantly checking different things, interacting with things, filling out different forms. Personalization in a digital future is about your digital footprint and you providing services and products to your members that are the right fit for them. And so it's a rethink, it's a paradigm shift in how we even think about the term personal. And lastly, if you think about the term disruption, the flip side of disruption is transformation. <laughs> if you think about, the reason I love transformation is because this is the positive aspect of all of this. It is the rebirth of the credit union mission. I'm not telling you that you have to leave behind your core values. I'm not saying that you have to put on some new identity that's not consistent with who you are. It's about reevaluating who are we, what do we bring to the table in this new environment. You have to adapt. That doesn't mean leave behind, it means reinvent. Figure out how do you shine, how do you be you in this new type of world. Okay, And I think that's what really brings us to this topic of innovation. And a lot of credit unions feel like, oh, well, we're just small. We don't have much of a budget. We don't innovate. Other people do that for us. You know, I know that there's a big convention hall here with lots of vendors, and I am not anti-partnership. But when credit unions start to just rely on vendors to do all the innovation for them, I think that's a huge mistake. Because if you think about the credit union industry, what is your superpower? Creative collaboration. And so think about the potential in this room. Now, this conference is amazing. You can hear speakers, you can network and share ideas, but the more we can innovate across the credit union industry, the faster you are going to move to that frontier so that you don't get left behind, so that you don't feel like you're constantly playing catch up. A lot of credit unions like to use this phrase, fast follower. I am not a fan. I know what the intent is and I understand it, but fast follower is inherently passive. It's sit back and watch, wait until the dust settles. Now I appreciate that you don't want to be bleeding edge, but you guys are leaders. That's why you're here. You want to be great at member service. You want to be great at employee satisfaction. You want to be great at community impact. But then when it comes to innovation, many credit unions say, well, we just want to be okay. Don't settle for okay. You have the potential to be great because you are more collaborative than any other industry that I know. And so lean into that, take advantage of that, because that's how you will adapt and innovate into the future. All right, so that's the motivation. That's the uh, kind of the big picture landscape. Let me give you a quick sneak peek to what I'm going to talk about this afternoon. So I've got a 145 breakout on blockchain, and this is like kind of my trailer to motivate you if you're curious to, to come learn, learn, more, learn more about this. I spend a lot of time talking to credit unions, especially credit union boards, about what is blockchain. Over the last two years, most of that was in the context of crypto. Because if you start to understand crypto, something like Bitcoin, crypto is an application of blockchain. Blockchain is the underlying technology that makes crypto work. But many credit unions are now backing away from crypto, like Bitcoin, because it's so volatile, some of the vendors in the market have gone under, do our members really want this? Does it even fit with our mission? 
And so what I've now developed is what I consider a proof of concept of how do we start to apply the technology of blockchain, but not in a crypto context, but in a lending context. And I'm not talking about lending crypto. I'm talking about car loans and mortgages on a blockchain. So what does that mean? If we're going to talk about a digital future, think about the fact that your loans are just data. It's just zeros and ones. What do credit unions produce? You don't produce widgets. There's nothing real that comes out of your front doors. When you produce loans, you are basically creating a digital ar ar artifact. It's just accounting. It's just moving numbers around on your balance sheet. But if we just kind of accept that and lean into it, then we could say, well, what if we rethink loans as digital assets? I'd like to take credit for this. Most people, when they use the term digital assets, they're talking about crypto. I think when we should talk about loans, we should talk about digital assets. Because then we can think about what is the best way to store, record, or transfer, transfer these digital assets that exist on your balance sheet. In the world of crypto, we call that tokenization. What if we could tokenize auto loans and mortgages? So the beauty of Filene is they've got this thing called a lab. I pitched this project to the Filene lab. I've got five credit unions working with me to, to test this proof of concept. We just had our final cohort call yesterday, and we are now exploring 2.0, which is how do we operationalize this to share with the credit union market. And so if you come to my session, you'll hear about that project. Some of those folks are even in this room. Josh Buck is going to give a kind of a little testimony of his experience. But it, just to give you one final picture, literally what we are doing is this. Those pictures are what are called NFTs. An NFT is a non-fungible token. When people hear about NFTs, and my guess is most of you are familiar with NFTs, you probably think of digital art. These are what are called the Bored Ape Yacht Club. But the reason you have to look beyond the drama and the silliness of NFTs is if you look at those two pictures, you realize these are not just random. They have a certain structure and they have certain attributes. The one on the left has a yellow background. The one on the right has a blue background. The one on the left has a striped t-shirt. The one on the right has a puffy vest. That is what's referred to as the metadata for an NFT. Those are just attributes and values. If we can take this same technology, which is what we've done, minting loans as non-fungible tokens, the data associated with those loans, FICO score, interest rate, debt to income, state of origination, all the characteristics that you associate with a loan package, we can record all of that information using this same technology, and now we have tokenized that data so that it can be displayed in a secondary market, so that credit unions can start to look at other pools of loans originated by other credit unions. They can start to fund through participations or loan sales, transfer of loans on a blockchain. I've even had conversations between Visions Credit Union and the Federal Home Loan Bank of New York about whether credit unions could pledge collateral to a home loan bank using this same technology. So this is not rocket science. We're basically taking the same technology that you see right here, but we are applying it to loans. I'm super excited about this because now, instead of just talking about this technology, we are building something with the technology. That's what credit unions should be thinking about. How do we experiment? How do we try new things? This was not easy. I stumbled all over the place, but we would present something, the credit unions would give us feedback, we would then come back two weeks later, repeat the process. If you've ever heard of something called the agile methodology, that's precisely what we're using here. How do we start to build and try and experiment? That's no offense, but that's not what credit unions are known for. Many of you, your starting point is how do we buy? How do we look at a list of different offerings, like a menu, and select which one we're going to use? 
When I met with the YP this morning, I said, you know what? We don't just need creative collaboration at the top. I love an event like this. I love executives and board members networking and talking to each other. But you need collaboration across these junior folks in your organization. As I get into AI, one of the things I'm working on developing is called an AI working group. People building AI projects across different credit unions, sharing those ideas, it's like show and tell. That's how we're gonna move forward faster. So we're not all reinventing the wheel, we are experimenting and building together. All right, if you're curious, 145, come check it out. All right, so the heart of this presentation is I want to talk to you about AI. Let me just give you a sense of why I think this is so important. For the last two years, I've been on this like road show with credit unions talking about crypto and blockchain. Many of you may have seen one of those presentations. That is not what people want to talk about today. And so I sort of looked at this emerging landscape and I said, okay, well, where is this headed? Where is the conversation going? What do people need to hear about now? And if you think about this type of picture, like an adoption curve over these next few years, I still am passionate about crypto and blockchain. I love this stuff. It is not what most of your credit unions need to be talking about. Like if you invited me to come talk to your board about crypto and blockchain, I'm happy to do that, but that's probably not the conversation we need to be having. I love the metaverse. I've done two virtual board and leadership team meetings where I'm in a VR headset, they are all in VR headsets, and we recreate a digital room, and I can literally stand at the front of the room as an avatar and present just like I'm presenting this morning. If any of you want to do that, I'm definitely game. <laughs> that, that is the funnest thing I've done, hands down. But no one wants to talk about the metaverse. It's just this, like, curiosity. It's kind of lost steam. Think about self-driving cars. All of that is on the horizon. But if you go to Phoenix, does anybody know? You can take a self-driving car to the airport. This is not just science fiction. But if you look at the left-hand side of this picture, notice I've put AI... AI, and I put 2024. This is the year to be having this conversation. When ChatGPT came on the scene in November of 2022, it was a game changer, a tipping point. AI has existed for a long time. It's been around since the 1950s. Many of you have already had different AI projects at your credit union, but with generative AI, now, the game has changed. The question is, how do we apply this technology? In other industries, it's rapidly changing. Credit unions, if you don't rapidly change, the world is going to move ahead of you. And this is why I want to kind of ring the bell, not to scare you, but maybe to wake you up and say, let's have this conversation. So what do I mean by this? So I have been trying hard to think about, as I meet with different boards and leadership teams, how do I simplify this? That's one of the things I love to do. I take complex things and I try and make them simple. That's what I've been doing for two years now with crypto and blockchain. Make it simple. AI has so many different applications. There's so many different ways that you can now pick up these tools and use them. And so I, I worry that it can be a little bit overwhelming if I were to show you like a full list, you might look at it and say, that's great, but where do I start? How do I prioritize? If you've never started on your AI journey as a credit union, where do you begin? And so I've developed this phrase that I wanna try with you, which I call horizontal plus vertical, okay? And so I'm just gonna break this down. This is basically what I'm gonna do for the next 20 minutes. It's try and help you understand horizontal applications of AI, vertical applications of AI, and then the plus is how you put them together. And so literally, I've tried to visualize this. 
as simply as I can. You don't know what this means, but I'm going to try and give you this picture and slowly unpack this to help you think about your AI journey and how you could gradually get started. And so let's jump in with the horizontal. And I told Patty, I brought props. <laughs> See, nothing says quality keynote speaker like props. But then Patty said, are you going to like break those? <laughs> I could do like a karate demonstration. I told her I was going to make her hold them so then I could like kick them or something. What do I mean by horizontal? Most of you, when you think about artificial intelligence, you probably think about your IT department or somebody in software or information services that is going to build something or buy something to apply AI at your credit union, but you're going to have no idea what they're doing or how it works. We're going to talk about those because I'm going to say those are more of a vertical deep dive application of AI. This is not something for everybody. It's like a specific business unit, and they are figuring out how to AI, use AI to solve their unique business problem in that business unit. We're going to get there. Those are the vertical applications. But I, what I want to suggest this morning is this is not where you need to focus or start. These you might think of as AI use cases, and we'll talk about some of those. But so many credit unions can get stuck thinking about the deep dive use case, the vertical application, thinking, well, which one? And there's so many, and I don't even understand them. Where do we start? So don't. Don't start with the vertical. Start with the horizontal. What do I mean by horizontal? Applications that span across the organization. Not a specific tool, a general tool, that anybody in your credit union can pick up and use. It is multi-purpose, and typically there is a user interface. Most of these applications, people in your organization are never going to touch or use. You might have like three to five people who even understand what it's doing. Horizontal applications are designed to be touched and used. They are interactive. That is the beauty of AI in this generation and this year is something that used to be in the back office that no one understood is now front and center and everybody's talking about, well, how can I use it? So what exactly even do I mean by this? What do these colors mean? Why do I have two of them? The reason I've put that first horizontal bar in green is I think this is where you should start as an organization. It's like a green light saying go. That first horizontal bar is generative AI. If you want to even get more specific, think of it as chat GPT. Let me ask a question here. So sometimes I did this with the YP group this morning. Sometimes when I ask how many people have used chat GPT, almost all the hands in the audience go up. I'm not going to ask that question. How many of you have used ChatGPT in a work setting for a work purpose? Look at that. More than half, for sure. It's a tool, ChatGPT. It's AI. You are credit union people using AI at your credit union. There's a user interface, and it's helpful. Whether you're using it to like write a job description, or an email, or some type of marketing campaign, there are many ways in which employees are using ChatGPT today. And think about this audience. This is board members and senior leaders. If we had a room full of credit union employees at the mid-tier and lower tier, that number would probably be three-fourths or higher. And so your employees are using these tools. The question is, are you talking about it? There's new evidence that shows many people are using AI for work purposes, but they are not disclosing it because they don't know how their leaders feel about it. There is a cultural issue. 
We're having this same discussion at DePaul because many of our students are asking us, well, is it cheating or is it helping? If we don't have that conversation with our students, then we're just not gonna talk about it. So as an organization, you need to start communicating with your employees about these tools, trying to understand how they're using them. Now, there's many ways in which you need to be careful with this. Like, you probably should have a, an appropriate use policy for a tool like ChatGPT. You do not want your employees, like, up, uploading credit union data into a public training model like that. But if you've ever heard of Microsoft Copilot, Microsoft Copilot is the same model, OpenAI, but in a secure data environment. And so all these fear tactics about, oh, well, like, if I do this, it's gonna show up over here, Microsoft solved that problem. There are so many excuses people give for not using this stuff. Another one is like hallucination. Well, it's not, it's not always right. Yes, but it, think of this. It's more like working with a personal assistant. Traditional computing, you tell the computer exactly what to do and that's what the computer does. Nothing more, nothing less. With an artificial intelligence like generative AI, it's more interactive. Sometimes they're gonna get it wrong. Sometimes they're gonna come up with stuff and you're like, whoa, I had not thought of that. There are gonna be ways in which it's going to improve your thinking, not just execute your thinking. Do you understand the difference? And so it's all about how do you harness that power and figure out how to manage those downside issues. Many vendors are now embedding this into their platforms. If many of you probably use Salesforce, Salesforce now has Einstein, their AI-powered customer relationship management. And so everybody's trying to figure out how do we incorporate this across the organization more effectively. The second bar, think about a deeper one. So this is not green, it's yellow. This isn't probably where you want to start but many credit unions are now looking at things like their knowledge base. Many of you have like a SharePoint system where you can store a lot of PDFs for policies, procedures, products, and services. How do your employees access your knowledge base? Typically it's through some type of search function. Typically those search functions do not work very well. This AI working group that I'm I've launched our first presenter earlier this week has created a generative AI agent to help the employees at their credit union search their internal knowledge base. The application is to start thinking about someone in a contact center, like one of your employees gets a call from a member, they don't know the answer. How do they get that answer? Do they ask a colleague? Do they start reading through these like 30 page documents? If they can use generative AI to get the answer quickly and contextually, you're not necessarily just feeding that back to the member immediately, but the employee is now empowered with this tool. And so it's still generative AI. It's still accessible to your employees, but it's not a general model. It is a trained specific model for your organization. That's step two. That's the yellow and the horizontal. And then lastly, the, the right side of this, the orange, start thinking about member facing. Chatbots have been around for years. Most of a, what ch traditional chatbots do is like a decision tree or a keyword pairing. If the member uses this word, give them this answer. It's basically a set of rules, kind of like a phone tree. Generative AI scratches all of that and it says, how do we start to interact with the member to figure out what is their intent and how do we provide answers to solve that issue? It is conversational. The same way you are using ChatGPT, you can think about a future in which your members use your chatbot to solve their problems with your knowledge base. This is gonna transform member servicing. So these are, these are another set of applications. So what are some horizontal takeaways? I think this is the place to start. If you're gonna talk about generative AI, think about the horizontal. Think about how these tools can be used across your organization. Start training your staff. What's appropriate, what's not, 
but don't just scare them. You have to encourage them. Think to encourage, because some people are afraid to pick up these tools, but if you start to explain, hey, you might be able to do your job better or faster. These are key, that's training and education. And then lastly, start to work with your team to figure out, can we do a better job of accessing our knowledge base? Maybe that's a vendor. There's a company called Senso AI that's gotten into this space. Maybe it's building it and developing it internally. These are all tools that are out there and you can start picking up and working with. All right, second half, the vertical. As you remember, the vertical, these are the deep dives. When you think about AI use case, you probably want to be thinking about vertical application, a particular business unit using AI to solve a specific business problem. One thing I want to highlight here is that these vertical applications, sometimes they are generative AI, sometimes they are not. There is a whole suite of AI tools that I would characterize more as machine learning. There's no chatbot, there's no language model, it's just predictive analytics done on a structured database. So when we talk about AI, part of your role or your education as an institution is starting to understand the difference between generative AI and machine learning. Because when you're talking about these vertical use cases, it could be one or the other or a mix of the two. So as you think about this vertical illustration and why I've put these here, you might have a generative one. That could be like taking all the transcripts from your contact center as a set of words, running those through a large language model and starting to say, what are our members telling us? Why are they calling? How are we helping them? Are we solving their problems? You can feed all of that, what's called unstructured data, into a large language model, and you will start to get insights from your contact center. One of my even rat more radical ideas, so many credit unions focus on net promoter score, NPS. Where's that data come from? It's typically a survey where you're asking somebody to answer some questions after the fact. This is going to completely replace NPS because now you've got the data, you've got the recording of that interaction. What was the sentiment? Were they happy? Were they mad? What was the issue? What was the response? Large language models can process all of that to tell you precisely what you need to know. You don't have to do surveys to answer those type of questions anymore. Think about other vertical applications in the machine learning space. These are the ones that are using structured data, typically like your core, your transactions, your loan files. They are using maybe even a data warehouse if your credit union has gotten that far. But they're taking all your existing data and saying, how do we process that more effectively to derive insights for business decision making. Again, there may not be any words. So this isn't gonna involve generative, it's not gonna involve large language models, it's just old fashioned predictive analytics. And if you think about like lending, most larger credit unions have already been asking themselves, how do we start to automate the loan underwriting decision? Because some of your loan applications are gonna be an obvious yes. Some of them are gonna be an obvious no. You do not wanna spend time with your loan officers processing those types of applications. That's a waste of time. That should be done by AI. The stuff in the middle, the gray area, that's where you want your people focusing their attention. The, the, the applications that are somehow not standard or there's something going on that doesn't quite fit your model. That's where humans shine. If you think about why AI is so powerful, it does what machines do more effectively so that humans can do what humans do more effectively. If you have people working at your organization that are basically doing the stuff that computers do, the manual routine tasks day over and day over, 
That is a misallocation of your human resources. One of my bets is that if you appropriately deploy AI in these types of situations, people will stop doing the grunt work, the copy and paste, the data entry, all of that stuff, and they will start doing the critical thinking work that we do best. What do you think is gonna to happen to your employee satisfaction? I think it's gonna go up. People are so scared about AI replacing people. That's what the media focuses on, of like machines taking over the world. Don't get sucked in. We were, I was at a Community Choice Credit Union. We did an event with like last year. Remember this, Patty? I was like the blockchain speaker, and then there was like an AI speaker. It was fear and like doom and gloom. <laughs> Remember that? And we walked out of the room, we're like, oh my God, like I'm scared. <laughs> yes, this stuff has risks. Yes, you need to manage those risks. But if you figure out how to use it for your purposes, you can solve those problems and you can do this effectively. And so as you think about vertical takeaways, Think about both generative AI and machine learning. How do you separate those? How do you deploy those in their unique strengths? Think about using Gen AI, Gen AI for textual analysis, like your call or contact center transcripts, and then take your machine learning deeper. Don't just rely on vendors or existing models. This is where this is headed, and you need to start kind of teching up a little bit to deploy these in a deeper way. All right, final last two pieces, and then I'll wrap up. Notice that original picture I gave you, there was a box. We had the horizontal and the vertical, but they were contained within a box. What is the box? That's where many of you come in. This is the AI governance, the AI strategy, AI leadership, and AI culture. If you're a board member here, and you have not had a conversation about AI or how to do governance at your credit union, you need to go to your team and say, why aren't we having this conversation? Because that's part of your role in the organization is to help define those parameters, those guardrails around where you're going to be comfortable moving forward. If you're here in your leadership team, you need to be thinking about where is our vision or mission as it relates to AI. You have a vision and mission for your organization. This is not just a little like software thing you plug in in the IT department. This is something you need to integrate into that broader vision and mission. And leadership, do you have an AI committee? Do you have an AI champion? This is not going to happen if you all just sit around looking at each other and say, I don't know, like, have you tried it? Have you read something? Someone needs to be tasked with this to make sure that you, they are moving the conversation forward and building a culture where people can talk about it. Because my guess is many of your employees, they don't know how you feel. They don't know what your vision or strategy is, and they might be using it on their phone on the side, even to help them do something at work, but they probably aren't gonna tell you because they were worried they might get in trouble. Open up the dialogue, have that conversation with your staff. And then lastly, the plus, this I think is where the future is really headed. The horizontal plus the vertical. Think about the vertical like machine learning, the data analytics. You are sitting on mountains of data that are going to help you understand your members and their preferences and their profile. You need to be tapping into all that data that you already have. The generative component is when you're going to be able to start tailoring your messaging to those members around that vertical understanding. If you start to understand who they are, what they want, and what will be most helpful, then you can start communicating to them by generating that interaction with generative AI to send messages that communicate those insights. One of the guys I'm working with at a credit union has already built this type of model for member personalization 
using all the core data you have on their profile, understand where they're headed, and then start sending them messages to help explain, this is what we can do for you on your member journey. That's the plus, that's the secret sauce. That's when you start to combine the horizontal and vertical. And so as you think about putting these things together, this I think is a potential AI adoption journey. This is a template that you can start to follow as an organization. Now let me just give you a few final thoughts on creative cl collaboration, and this is where I'm gonna conclude. How do we create a pipeline of digital innovation? I mentioned this phrase, everything, everywhere, all at once. That might feel overwhelming, but if you think about what I've already presented here today, blockchain, now commonly referred to as Web3. We've got credit unions working on that. Artificial intelligence, generative AI, machine learning. We've got credit unions working on that. One of the, the projects that I'm trying to move forward now is how do we start to innovate in the payment system I'm starting to work with Valera, doing research with them on how we can move faster towards things like real-time payments. Juntos avanzamos. The credit union member of the future is changing. That's a Spanish phrase that means together we advance. Many of you are probably familiar with inclusive. Some of you might even be Juntos avanzamos designated. What does that have to do with this conversation? The future isn't just technology, the future is also demographics. If you don't start thinking about how to better serve the member of the future, you're gonna get stuck serving the member of today. I'm not saying that you abandon the member of today, but they are not going to be the same demographic as the member of the future. You've gotta start pivoting and preparing for that. These topics like open banking, embedded finance, streamline onboarding, let's create a roadmap Let's start creating these collaborative opportunities, not just at the team executive level, but at more of kind of like a working group level. That's where I think we're going to see more innovation and more success. That's where we can create the credit union of the future. Thank you very much. If you wanna connect, can we get the QR code one more time? If you want to connect, please do so. I'd love to continue the conversation. I'll be around through lunch. I'll be doing my breakout this afternoon, and I look forward to meeting some of you during the breaks. Thank you. All right. Nice work. Karate chat. You want to hold on? <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Lamont.